Good morning and welcome to the 29th annual U.S. Army War College Strategy Conference. Uh, I'm Steve Metz, the Director of Research at the Strategic Studies Institute, or SSI, which puts the conference together for the War College. Uh, I've been the program developer for this year's conference. This is actually the fourth time I've had a chance to put one of these conferences together since joining SSI in the 1990s. And I have to tell you, I'm as excited about this year's event as any of the conferences that I've been involved with. The audience in the auditorium includes the Army War College's resident class of 2018, faculty and invited guests, but will also be joined by a virtual audience from around the world who will watch the live stream of the event. So I would like to welcome the virtual audience who's watching now and let you know that we have a mechanism for you to participate in the discussion as well. And here's how that'll work. You can pose questions or comments via Twitter or email. The live viewing page of the event will explain to you how to do that. It's got links and a hashtag there. If you are sending a question or comment to us, specify if you're directing it to a specific panelist. And that way our people will get the information to us on the stage so we can be sure that the person that you want to interact with um, gets the, uh, the question or comment. Let me start this morning by talking for a few minutes about how we design this year's conference. And the reason I do that is anytime I ask someone to listen to something or read something, you know, I feel an obligation to explain to them why I'm asking for some of their valuable time. I think you deserve that. So I would like to take about five or 10 minutes just to explain to you why we're here and why we're talking about this particular topic. SSI actually begins planning the annual strategy conference about six months or so in advance. And the first step, of course, is to identify the conference topic. But that's a lot harder than you might imagine. We have to find an issue, first of all, that won't be overcome by events between the time we identify it and the time we hold the conference. We need a topic that's important to the Army, the Joint Force, the broader community of security experts, uh, and other nations. And we need a topic that the Army War College is particularly well positioned to explore, one that's sort of in the War College's sweet spot. And that's kind of the tricky part, because there are a lot of important strategic issues that other organizations like Washington think tanks or civilian universities are simply better equipped to tackle than we are. What the Army War College does particularly well, I believe, is to provide a bridge between the world of ideas and the world of working strategic leaders and strategists. Since the college operates under a policy of academic freedom, it can be creative. It can look deeper into the future than a lot of other Army organizations. The War College can challenge existing assumptions and conventional thinking in a way that, say, the Army staff couldn't. But at the same time, what we can do is make the ideas that we explore useful to today's U.S. military uh, leaders and future strategic leaders. So to put it a little differently, I, I personally believe the Army War College's value is to be simultaneously future-looking, creative, iconoclastic, and relevant. So that was the context that helped us design this year's conference. And that's also what led me to propose the future of strategic leadership as the conference topic. And I began this with an idea that sounds kind of simple, but which has a lot of, uh, of intricate and I think vitally important implications. I mean, we all know that Clausewitz observed that war has both an enduring nature and a changing character. And as I thought about it, I became convinced that that same thing is true for strategic leadership. Like war, it too has an enduring nature and a changing character. So the key for anyone working in the field of strategy is understanding the difference between this enduring nature and changing character in order to prepare for the changing character. And that's the objective of this conference, is to help tease out that difference between the two and to begin thinking about the changing uh, uh, character of strategic leadership. I suspect we've all thought about strategic leadership's enduring nature 
at some point in our career. It includes attributes and skills like the ability to motivate people to do difficult, sometimes dangerous things, the ability to harmonize, integrate, and focus an organization in the face of great complexity, often while an adversary is actively and deliberately trying to prevent it. It requires the ability to understand the second, third, even fourth order effects of our decisions, to motivate and communicate clearly to diverse partners, constituencies, and adversaries, to create and sustain an ethical organizational culture, uh, to prepare an organization or nation for the future while making sure that it's effective in the near term, and to know when it's time to abandon old concepts, processes, and organizations and build new ones. Edward Litvak once observed that in strategy, what worked today probably won't work tomorrow. Everything has kind of a built-in lifespan. You have to know when the old ways are running out of steam and it's trying to innovate. And that's particularly challenging if you're a strategic leader because we all know that it's human nature to simply keep doing what's working until you reach the point of disaster. In any case, I think these are some of the aspects or parts of strategic leadership's enduring nature. These are things that were as important for strategic leaders in the first human kingdoms and empires as they will be for future ones. But understanding strategic leadership's enduring nature is the easy part because we have history to, to learn from. Understanding the changing character is a lot more challenging. If you haven't given it rigorous thought so far in the academic year or your career, I hope that the discussions we're going to have over the next couple of days will encourage you to think about this. And what I'd like to do is help you begin that intellectual journey by sketching a few vignettes that I think may indicate the direction and intensity of strategic leadership's changing character. Now, what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is pose questions, but not at this point suggest answers. Hopefully, during today and tomorrow, some of the answers will begin to emerge. But I really look at this as the beginning of, of kind of a, at least a career-long, if not a, uh, a lifelong effort to understand the changing nature of strategic leadership, what it means for you, what it means for the organizations that you serve. Let me start with the ability to communicate clearly and effectively, which, of course, is a central component of strategic leadership. Now, we all know that some humans are born with an innate talent for this. But while not everyone can become a transcendent communicator, you know, say a Winston Churchill with his amazing ability to use language to inspire in the face of great challenges and dangers, Many people can become at least effective communicators. Exactly what that means, though, is context dependent. Take, for example, General Ulysses Grant. He became the most successful military leader in the American Civil War, not because he was particularly creative or had great personal charisma, but because he understood what needed to be done at that time. He clearly communicated how to do it, and he didn't get rattled under pressure. I mean, we've probably all heard the story that uh, General Sherman saw Grant leaning against a tree at the end of that horrific, disastrous first day of the Battle of Shiloh and said, and said, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? And Grant thought for a second and said, yes, lick him tomorrow, though. And that, that really kind of encapsulates uh, Grant's approach to his job in strategic leadership. So what that demonstrates is that Grant had exactly the type of communication skills and personal attributes needed for his time, the beginning of the era of industrial warfare, when war generally involved binary conflict between relatively symmetric conventional adversaries, whether nations, coalitions, or factions. But what type of communication skills will future strategic leaders need, and how will they get them? I suspect that writing clear orders for subordinate military commanders, which Grant was a master at, won't be enough. If we could somehow teleport Grant through time and make him a strategic leader in 2030, chances are that he wouldn't be 
all that effective because the context for strategic leadership will be different. And I think the same is true of many past great strategic leaders, whether at Dwight Eisenhower, at George Marshall, or anyone like that. And let me explain what I mean by that. Let me just kind of give a couple of examples or vignettes about what I see as the changing nature of the information environment and communication that puts different demands on strategic leaders. We all hear a lot these days about things like data mining, uh, increasingly powerful psychological models, cutting edge brain science, all used for what's sometimes called narrative engineering. And this is very popular uh, in the private sector and even for political leaders. They have highly trained experts and powerful tools of influence to help them do that precisely so they have the desired psychological effect when they communicate with their intended audience. Put it differently, what I think is happening right now is that strategic communications is shifting, at least in part, from an art to a science. So where does that leave military strategic leaders? I mean, they too have to communicate with diverse audiences. Subordinates, political superiors, other government partners, multinational parties, partners, adversaries, sometimes the public. Should military strategic leaders also use data mining, brain science, and narrative engineering tools to hone their message? If Ulysses Grant isn't the model for a future military strategic leader, might Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that who really understands the science of narrative engineering be the model for the future? What if the US military decided for ethical reasons that it doesn't want to use science to augment the communication skills and influence of its strategic leaders? Wouldn't that put it at a severe competitive disadvantage to potential adversaries who had used it? Can we opt out of technology for ethical reasons if our competitors and adversaries are using it against us? What would you do if you were a strategic leader at some point in the coming years and your staff came to you with these sorts of tools that could make your strategic communications more effective? Do you embrace them, reject them, sort of grudgingly and partially accept them? What if political leaders came to you in the future and asked why the Army or the Joint Force wasn't using data mining, brain science, and narrative engineering? Would you oppose it or support it? Would you be able to explain to political leaders why you opposed or supported it? Personally, I believe that future strategic leaders, possibly someone in this room, will face that exact challenge because the, the, this, this turning strategic communications from an art to a science isn't science fiction, but it's an emerging reality. Let me suggest another coming technology-related challenge. Pretty soon, artificial intelligence will make it difficult to know whether you're communicating with a real or artificial person. There are a lot of predictions, for instance, that within a couple of decades, you won't know whether your physician or salesperson you're dealing with is real or not. And often you won't care because uh, it, it really won't matter. The question is, should that also apply in the military realm? What about a future, charismatic, brilliant strategic leader who communicates effectively with desired audiences, but who is not real? Is that beyond the pale for the United States, even if adversaries are, are doing it? Will the best strategic leaders in 2030 be humans, artificial entities, or some combination? What about some sort of Wizard of Oz, Oz system that gives charisma to someone without it? If your staff came to you 10 or 15 years from now and proposed a way to artificially enhance your personal charisma, your ability to manage complexity, your ability to inspire others or something like that, would you accept it? Would you want your subordinate commanders to have the same sort of Wizard of Oz ability? And again, this is an emerging reality. It's not that far off. There's a reasonable chance that someone in this room will face that sort of ethical and professional dilemma in the future. Let me, let me uh, pose a third communication challenge that's, uh, that's not so technology related. I, we all know that we live in an era of information profusion 
and political hyperpartisanship. I mean, in previous decades in the United States, there were only a few authoritative sources of information for the public. I mean, when I was a kid, there were you know, three television networks, a few major news magazines, and a handful of major newspapers and journals of opinion. This reliance on a limited number of carefully edited information sources pushed political discourse and ideas toward the middle. And that facilitated compromise and consensus building and made our political system work. Now, as we all know, the information environment is very different. There are thousands, maybe even millions of sources of information. Everyone can tailor the information they consume to their own biases and proclivities. The result is that many, probably most people today, only believe information sources that confirm their pre-existing biases and proclivities. And why that's really, really important is that it pushes political positions away from the middle and toward the ideological poles. It increases hostility toward people and organizations on the a different end of the political spectrum. And that's really, really important. We, today we often hear the phrase political tribalism. The idea that leaders and publics in the public are driven by an intense loyalty to their political tribe, and that structures the way they think and respond to ideas. Politics today is treated less like a process for reconciling diverse positions and reaching consensus than war by other means. You know, kind of call it the evil twin of Clausewitz's observation that war is politics by other means. Today, politics in some ways is war by other means. And it gets even worse than that. Today there's so much competition for the attention of audiences that the entertainment value of information is as important as its content or authoritativeness. In some cases even more important. Again, this is pushing political discourse toward ideological poles and toward extreme paralyzing partisanship. Compromise today is treated as a loss, and no one wants to lose. So what does military strategic advice to decision makers mean in this context? Will it be incumbent on future military strategic leaders to tailor their advice to the ideological biases and proclivities of the political leader or political tribe they're presenting it to? Must strategic advice be shaped by political tribalism? And if not, how can you avoid that? Can military strategic leaders be above, of, or outside political tribalism? I think we'd all agree they should, but how can they do that? Will uniformed leaders have to propose military options that they know can be completed in one presidential administration since the next one's likely to reverse it? So will that take any sort of protracted effort for us off the table? Must future strategic advice be entertaining so that political leaders will remember it in this environment where the entertainment value of information matters almost as much as the content? I think these are all huge challenges. We're just beginning to see them now, but I really think that this particular trend is going to continue, and it will be something that you will face in your career. What about the process for finding strategic leaders? I, in the military today, we have a very formal system for doing that. Everyone comes in at the bottom, goes through a rigid set of steps, including both education and command. They hold positions of increasing responsibility. Then a few are selected as strategic leaders. Now, a lot of times that works beautifully, but sometimes it doesn't. We all know that we have had strategic leaders in the past who simply didn't understand strategy. And unfortunately, the nation sometimes pays the price for that. But maybe it doesn't have to work that way. In the near future, there may be ways to identify who has the talent to be a strategic leader using technology and science. Now, that could be a good thing, but what if that person is not a product of the formal system? Do we empower the person with the most innate ability for strategy, or do we continue to select only from the pool of people who have progressed through a set system of command and education? What if it's possible to know for certain, through science, 
that the best strategic leader for the future is not a general who's come, or admiral who's come through the system, but an E-5, maybe someone who's never been in the military. What if we can know for certain, through science, that some assistant manager of a CarMax would be a better wartime commander than the serving four stars? Put it differently, do we cling to our current system for identifying strategic leaders, even if we know that it's suboptimal? Or do we optimize the system, given the problems, disadvantages, and challenges of that? And again, this is something that's happening and is, and is going, to, going to increase. You may have to help the Army, the Joint Community, the nation, or other nations think through this dilemma in the future. Finally, let me pose uh, some questions on civil-military relations. Over the centuries, the military has become a profession separate from all the others, in part because war sometimes called for killing. Democracies like the United States needed an institution that could do that when necessary, but they wanted the killing institution to be well controlled by civilian leaders and separate from the rest of society in both a physical and psychological sense. But what of a future where the killers are not trained humans or doing something they don't want to do but must, but instead are machines and algorithms, or perhaps some synthesis of humans and machines, super soldiers enhanced by technology. Do we even need a military profession if or when civilian leaders could fight wars with machines, networks, and swarms, all controlled by artificial intelligence, rather than living, breathing soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who put themselves in harm's way? If we do go in that direction, what will the military ethos of the future be? What will military strategy be? What type of people will formulate military strategy? And how will they interact with technology as they do so? In an even broader sense, what type of civil military relations will we need in an era of robots and artificial intelligence? Will we simply update our old model of civil military relations that's held us in good stead for a long time? Or will we need something entirely new? And if we do need something entirely new, what might it be? As we develop technologically enhanced soldiers, how will they fit into society? Or will they be so feared that they'll be shunned and forced to live separately from the rest of society forever? These are just a few of the challenges and questions that I hope we'll touch on during the next two days. I, they're, they're, they're tough issues. They're, 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 they're very difficult questions that require the best minds to grapple with them, and that's why we're here. Uh, when I began building this conference a number of months ago, and I started thinking about who I wanted as panelists and speakers, you know, I, I, I wanted people who were thoughtful, interesting, and provocative. I mean, I really wanted... Uh, speakers who would get you out of your comfort zone and challenge you. And I also wanted a slate of panelists and speakers that reflected the diversity of our Army, the joint community, the joint force in the nation. And by that I mean in terms of diversity, experience, and perspective. Hopefully by tomorrow you'll think I came pretty close to hitting that target, or even better, that I nailed it. I also designed this conference as a dialogue rather than simply a transmission of information from panelists and speakers to the audience. I mean, I've sat through conferences in, my past, in, the, in the past where we got briefed by people with lots of bullet slides. I didn't want that. So I really intended this to be a dialogue. Uh, you know, I've asked the speakers to keep their prepared comments fairly limited so that we can have an exchange. So I really need you to be engaged participants to ask questions, to uh, uh, offer counter perspectives, and to challenge the panelists and speakers uh, in the same way that uh, I hope they'll challenge you. And let me make one more point before we move on. You know, I know some of you may, may be thinking out there that you'll be out of the military by 2030, so this whole topic is of no interest to you. You know, I disagree with that because I think, but because I think even though a, a large segment of you will no longer be in uniform or 20, uh, by 2030, a lot of you will still be opinion shapers in the United States or in, in your nation. So you'll be helping your nation think about security and strategic leadership. 
And even more importantly, between now and 2030, a lot of you out there will help prepare the next generation of strategic leaders who will be the one who, who take the torch in 2030 and beyond. So I really think you have skin in the game on this, this issue. So here are, my, here are my goals for the conference. They're fairly limited. Hopefully by tomorrow, I want as many of you as possible to walk out with two thoughts. One is that the future of strategic leadership is important. And second, that it's something you probably haven't considered as deeply as you need to. So hopefully this conference will be the beginning of a long process of discussion and thought. So if I can hit that target, I'll be happy. So let's get to it. What we're going to do now is shift right into uh, the first panel. We have two panels today. Then we'll convene to seminars after lunch. So at this point, I'd like to ask the members of the first panel to join me on stage. Now, people are supposed to walk out that door. So welcome to panel one of the strategy conference. The objective of this panel is to begin answering uh, some of the questions I proposed in my opening remarks. What, we're, what we're, we're going to deal with here is what will it mean to be a strategic leader in the new, new uh, environment? If a strategic leader of 2030 isn't a Grant, a Marshall, or an Eisenhower, what will he, she, or it look like? Uh, you all also know that the Army War College talks about strategic leaders as theorist uh, 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 practitioners. And heck, Chuck, I forgot the third one, even though I invented that. Any, any, anyhow, there's a, a three-way construct for it. Uh, so we, we'd like to talk about whether that construct still makes uh, sense in the future. And I'm sure other questions and issues within these broad contours will come up. Our panelists for panel one are people of such accomplishment that I'm not going to use a lot of their time to kind of go over their bios. You all have that. I would, uh, would encourage you to, uh, to, to take, a, take a, a look at them. But our panelists today include uh, Dr. Sarah Sewell, who's currently at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Major Matt Kavanaugh, who's currently a research fellow at the U U.S. Air Force Academy, and the Army War College's own uh, Professor Chuck Allen. And I've asked each of them to make five to ten minutes of comments to stoke the discussion, and then we'll move uh, uh, right into uh, the dialogue. And as we begin that, let me once again remind the virtual audience that there is a Twitter hashtag and email address on the conference website, so as you listen to people, you know, begin formulating the direction you'd like us to go as well. So, uh, Sarah, if you could, uh, could kick us off. Sure. Thanks, Steve, and it's great to be here. And I am, um, I'm not just uh, a recovering undersecretary of state, I'm also a current academic, and as such, I feel I need to push back on some of the questions being asked of us here. Uh, it's ornery and it's in my nature. And so what I want to start by doing is suggest that, or remind us perhaps, that when we're talking in this venue, in an army audience about strategic leadership, we really want to sort of step back and think about strategic leadership more broadly. And Steve has, has graciously invited us to do that. And it's important because the vision that Steve has of the future is one in which the paradigm shift may require us to look beyond the way the Army originally, or for traditionally, as Conrad Crane reminded you yesterday, has traditionally looked at the question. I think that, that when you consider leadership from a military perspective, you know, the military is essentially a threat-based organization, and so they think about leadership from the perspective of identifying and responding and defeating a threat. And that's one form of strategic leadership, right? Technically, strategic leadership just means, you know, you've got a vision and you're going to marshal your means to achieve that vision. So the kind of strategic leaders that we tend to identify as having been successful model strategic leaders are people who sort of read the threat right and defeated it. We don't often celebrate as strategic leaders those who are defeated. Um, and yet, many moments in our history have called for 
strategic leadership of a very different character. And so as we, as, as Steve invites us to sort of blow apart the future paradigm of what we're going to require for strategic leaders, we may need to think more broadly about, about the, what we're asking strategic leaders to do in the future. Um, so maybe they are responding to and defeating a threat, but maybe they're also repairing a country from a very different form of damage or challenge. Or maybe a strategic leader is a Sun Tzuian sort of strategic leader who's able to avert the conflict that would then require the restoration. But truly, when I think about the strategic leaders that I admire most, they're the ones that have managed to bridge many different forms of leadership. They've led in war, and they've led in peace, and they've been sort of civilian type leaders and military type leaders. So, you know, the Eisenhowers or the the Lincolns or the FDRs are really, I think, the apotheosis of strategic leadership because they're beyond simply military leaders and they're beyond simply defeating an enemy. And so, and, and people who are right in one role are often not right in another role. And, and Steve pointed out that a, a, a strategic leader's success tends to be very context specific. One need only think of Churchill to realize that he was sort of rejected in many ways for his style for a long time and then really rose to the occasion and for a very different need. So there is possibly no one right form of strategic leadership and strategic leader, maybe the real question is what type of strategic leader do we need for what type of, of challenge or circumstance, historical circumstance. Second point is that um, as war becomes more complicated uh, technologically, I think Steve really raises an important question, which is what, what does the military art or even the military science mean in a world in which um, we don't have set piece battles? And we're, 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 and it's not, we didn't go from set piece battles and we didn't go to essentially um, conventional war superimposed on psychological and indirect operations in the way that we sort of moved to coin. You know, now we're in a really different environment that the army is just beginning to feel its way through with multi-domain battle and just beginning to think about what is sort of automation and what is, what is the extended, extended reach of humans through technology going to mean and what is the collapsed frame of war and peace going to mean in this new competitive environment where we're trying to avoid war, we're trying to, to escalate down from war, but we're kind of in war all the time. You know, that really does suggest that our traditional precepts of, of, of military strategic leadership are probably insufficient. Um, it's less clear that the chain in which we've traditionally celebrated and identified leaders, you know, people who have had operational command throughout their careers, is really what's relevant for understanding um, this, this current environment. And that's not to suggest that you can just pull, you know, whoever the car wash guy or, or the best gamer or even someone who fundamentally understands the adversary, although I think there's a lot to be said for that, particularly as we move into programmed war as opposed to improvised war, human-led war. I think there's a lot to be said for understanding um, the, the modalities of programming of the enemy. Um, but I just, I don't think I can go run Google, but I don't necessarily think that someone trained in, you know, tank maneuver is going to be the right kind of leader to choose for a war 20 years hence. So the experience may be less relevant in important ways. Um, I do think there are some enduring things that we can identify, and others who are more expert and who, who focus their careers on this probably can do a better job. But communication is clearly an issue. But I, for me, the a priori issue is what's the goal? Is what's the goal? And, and so I want to make a couple points on that. First of all, um, Strategic leadership and a goal is not value neutral. You know, in the same way that rule of law is not value neutral. You can have really dangerous laws. You can have really dangerous goals. People could argue that Hitler was a great strategic leader, didn't really like his goals, right? So, so these are not value neutral propositions when you talk about you've got to have a vision, you've got to have a strategy, it's got to be focused on a goal, it's got to be the right goal. Um, you know, four freedoms is a whole lot better than, than nothing, even if it's a justification for the protection of a homeland and a way of life and, and a country. So you've got to have the right kind of goal. Um, 
nonviolent leaders who had goals of social change in many ways had a more difficult challenge than someone who simply wants to preserve something by defeating an enemy. And so, and so what kind of goals we're going to have in an environment in which the war peace blur is, it, is the war peace continuum is blurred is a whole, it's a whole different question. Um, and the goal cannot be about self. I mean, you talk about changes in the environment. Um, some of the best advice I ever got when I took my forays into Washington was there are leaders who want to do things and there are leaders who want to be things, right? We're, we're increasingly, I think, um, partly as a function of our complacency, able to um, envision leaders or, or leaders are able to, leaders who want to be are able to manipulate and become leaders in ways that we really need to question. And so this issue of what's the substance of your goal and how that relates to our judgment of, a, of an effective and, and admired leader, I think is something that we all have to chew on. Um, I think communication becomes very difficult for the reasons that Steve was talking about in terms of the ability to automate. I agree that, that strategic communication is becoming more of a science. But I think what that also suggests is that, the, that the, the issues of trust and authenticity become very, very important. And we're going to need strategic leaders that have that, even if they fight in an environment that challenges that. Um, finally, I want to suggest that, um, that, that as we think about enduring uh, elements of leadership and as we think about an increasingly complicated environment, it should be clear to all of us that we're not, no one person is likely to, to know enough in a way that strategic leaders of the past might have been able to know enough from personal experience. So I think the, the issue of building a team, of being able to, to know what you don't know, to be able to assemble the right coalition to sort of fuse knowledge and collectively come to this core issue, which is discerning the right problem and marshalling the means to address it, is still going to be a, a fundamentally human endeavor and a fundamentally critical endeavor of strategic leadership into an unknown future. So let's stop there. Oh, and by the way, I remember the three legs of the uh, three different types of strategic leadership. <laughs> I'm going to speak from the podium so that I have great remarks. So, a second, please. Uh, All right, very good. Good. Good morning. It's, it's a pleasure to be a part of this opening panel for the Strategy Conference. I've addressed several different audiences over the past few years on the topic of leader development, especially for senior leaders. In November of 2016, I spoke to the Virginia Military Institute's Conference on Leadership and Ethics, and I talked about the topic of developing strategic leaders for 2040. In October 2017, to the Illinois Army National Guard Commanders Conference on Leadership in Multi-Domain Battle. Also that October, to the Executive Development Roundtable at Boston University on the development of senior Army leaders and general officers. Each group was interested in current trends in leader development and, importantly, learning about what changes were needed for successful leadership of organizations and institutions in the future. I approach this panel's topic of strategic leadership with three basic questions. What has not changed? What has changed? And what should we do? Well, to understand the future, I look back at the past to examine what we have learned about senior leadership and how that might or should shape how we identify, select, and develop strategic leaders for the future. I found a 1976 Department of the Army pamphlet, which was the seventh in the Leadership Monograph series. It was titled Leadership for the 1970s. It outlined past research and findings on organizational leadership. The monograph separated leader roles and functions by levels, with the two highest being top and executive leadership. Thus, the document was primarily focused on the individual great leader or the great group of executives. The next document was the proceedings of the Strategic Leadership Conference held here in Carlisle Barracks in February 1991. Not unlike this conference, it was populated with senior officers, scholars, and corporate leaders. It was charged with two goals. First, to examine and understand the then new concept of strategic leadership for the post-Cold War era in light of the changes in the national security environment and the trends that were forecasted for not only a new decade, but also for a new century. The second goal was to establish a continued dialogue among the scholars and practitioners who will contribute to the development of strategic leaders. 
That conference and subsequent activities resulted in three key documents. A 1995 article by then Army War College Commandant Major General Richard Chilcote. That article was titled, Strategic Art, the Discipline for 21st Century Leaders. The 1999, correction, 1998 release of the Strategic Leadership Primer and the 1999 publication of Field Manual FM 22-100, Army Leadership, Be, No, Do. Through the work of the Strategic Art Task Force, of which Steve Metz was a member, Chilcote identified key roles for military leaders at the strategic level, the strategic leader, the strategic practitioner, and the strategic theorist. He identified the strategic leader as one who provides vision and focus, capitalizes on command and peer leadership skills, and inspires others to act. To establish the context in which the military and strategic leaders operate, the SO Primer seeded the acronym of VUCA to denote the characteristics of the strategic environment. You know it as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The Primer also provided a framework for strategic leadership competencies that our War College students are very familiar with. Those competencies are conceptual, technical, and interpersonal. The War College worked parallel with that of many scholarly and practitioner literatures of that decade. Accordingly, we have adopted the roles put forth by Henry Mintzberg based upon his study of chief executive officers. The roles are interpersonal, to represent the organization to its members and external audiences, informational, to gather, analyze, and disseminate information as well as to share knowledge, and decisional, to give direction, set priorities, allocate resources, and resolve issues. My department colleagues contend that these roles for business executives and for top management teams are consistent across domains and are appropriate for the military context of senior and strategic leaders. The Primer was updated in 2004 for a second edition to adapt to the emergence of the post 9-11 world. It incorporated the results of the Strategic Studies Institute research project led by Dr. Lenny Wong that identified six meta competencies to frame the ever-growing list of leader competencies. For example, the Army's Be No Do framework has an FM 22-100 with a separate chapter of strategic leadership. And that chapter contains 23 separate competencies with the strategic level. Our colleague, Dr. Steve Garrison, at the 2010 revision of the Primer to ensure its relevance for the 21st century in an era of persistent conflict after nearly a decade at war. And Dr. Tom Galvin is the lead for the fourth edition that is projected for publication this year. His theme is vision, align, and enable to highlight the strategic leaders' internal and external activities to influence people, structure, strategies, and processes. The revised primer is designed to be applicable for senior leaders within the operating and generating forces for warfighting commands, enterprise level organizations, and across the profession of arms. Accordingly, the definition for strategic leadership has evolved from the 1998 one. Then it was the process used by a leader to affect the achievement of a desirable and clearly understand, understood vision by influencing the organizational culture, allocating resources, directing through policy and directive, and building consensus within a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. There's that VUCA thing again, which is a mark by opportunities and threat. For the 2018 edition of the Primer, strategic leadership is now defined as the process of aligning people, systems, and resources to achieve a vision for the enterprise while enabling an adaptive and innovative culture necessary to gain competitive advantage in a dynamic environment. For me, the enduring aspects of strategic leaders are their influence with amplified impacts and the consequences of their decisions and actions for short, mid, and long-term time horizons. The importance of their sense-making, the ability to discern truth and to critically assess information under post-truth conditions, and their ability to communicate effectively. The importance of their sense-making, the ability, again, to discern that great truth, and they need to be agile leaders. They need to highlight the importance of their cognitive ability, but also the conceptual capacities. And ultimately, leaders are about developing and exerting power and influence for self, for their teams, 
for organizations and institutions and for those external to organizational boundaries. Perhaps the most important things that the leader does at the strategic level is to apply judgment. Organizational scholars Warren Bennis and Noah Tishy talks about the idea of a leader's success or perceived success is based upon the trust and their judgment across three major areas. Judgment about people, who to bring in, who to develop, and who to move on. Judgment about strategy, that is the direction of the organization. Determine the objectives, methods, and allocation of resources to achieve organizational purpose and to identify, assess, and mitigate risks to those same issues. And judgment about what to do in times of crisis. What are the guiding principles and values that inform organizational decisions and action in such times? So in reflection, what has changed? Perhaps it is only our understanding, the understanding of the external environment that continues to present challenges and opportunities, those that we were previously unaware of and thus could not understand. We now have words and a vocabulary to describe a, comp a complex adaptive system and we have a better appreciation of the nature of com competition among allies, among coalition partners, and among potential adversaries. We have better understanding of the internal environment that is manifest in organizational culture and organizational climate and the impact of leaders on both. And we understand the need to have effective developmental programs for leaders to support and accelerate their acquisition of practice, of knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors necessary, but may not be sufficient for their success. I will close with what should we do? Really, it comes down to two points. First, as institutions, the Army and the other services, as well as the Department of Defense, should reinforce professional military education as well as civilian, civilian education programs as essential elements of strategic leader development. These programs are necessary to provide a foundation that is grounded for leader judgment formed by the application of strategic thinking. Second, our future leaders need earlier exposure through assignments to the enterprise environment and other broadening experiences to identify talented individuals and develop their capacity to meet the emerging requirements of the strategic environment. In sum, once again from Chilcote's essay, strategic leadership skills are developed over the course of a career through formal and informal education and self-development and additionally through additional professional experience. So thank you for your indulgence. Looking forward to other comments from the panel and to your questions later on this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Matt? Okay. As I begin, you'll have to indulge my payments on a couple of intellectual debts. I owe great public thanks to two individuals seated right here in this very room. In 2009, Dr. Sewell said, we lack the tools to judge military leadership. And in 2012, Dr. Metz wrote, it's time for Americans to think deeply about the skills their senior military leaders must have, otherwise we risk identifying those skills through the failures of military leaders who lack them. These triggered something for me. They, they provoked something in me that questions what makes great generals, what accounts for successful military supreme commanders. And there are two grains of gunpowder that help fire the starter's pistol on my dissertation, some of which I'm about to share with you. And so I thank the both of them for that. Not always. It was a long road, but when you read up on generalship and supreme command, you find myths everywhere. Here's one Lieutenant Colonel's definition from 2013. True generalship is an ability to borrow elements of Patton's technical military competence and the moral pureness of Gandhi mixed with Bill Clinton's artful communication, Ryan Crocker's diplomatic savvy, and George Kennan's strategic acumen. In other words, to approximate a fraction of the soul of George Marshall. That's a great captain's Twitter bio, or it might be God's. And I didn't make that up. Somehow it even smells wrong. Um, I think in the Army we're often guilty of a softer, subtler mythology, an overfocus, and maybe even an obsession with a generalized definition of leadership. I was actually just at West Point, where in rapid succession I heard the command sergeant major say he wanted to build leaders of character. The commandant told the cadets to be a leader. And the superintendent said he wanted West Point to be the prime leader development institution in the world. 
those are comments that you would expect, but um, we use the word leader so much and so often that I worry it's become our version of LOL or fear of missing out, just an empty catchphrase. And it's not just us in uniform. Uh, the historian Jeremy Black, in answering the question how Washington won the Revolutionary War, ultimately provided a one-word answer, leadership. Um, but leadership is constant. At war, both sides have leaders. Both sides have a supreme commander. The better question is, what's the difference between successful leadership and unsuccessful leadership, and successful supreme command and unsuccessful supreme command? And that was my dissertation topic, or as sometimes I call it, what it's like to be locked in a room for five years by yourself. Um, so I set out to, as the British historian Sir Michael Howard has put it, demythologize supreme command and to answer Dr. Sewell and Metz's productive provocations. So what did I find that made the difference? It wasn't material factors, weapons, or stuff. It wasn't luck, and their adversaries were competent. The difference was superior judgment and decision-making, following Professor Allen's remarks as being most important. When I looked at the successful performance of three supreme commanders that had steered wars to a successful conclusion over periods where the wars might have gone either direction, so General Washington in 76 and 77, uh, General Grant in 1864 up through the election that year, and then Eisenhower as he entered the continent of Europe all through, the, the, through securing Paris. Um, I found their judgments were objectively better than their unsuccessful adversaries. Different strategies, different time periods, different war aims all changed while a careful reading of the dispatches, memorandums, and most importantly decisions of those supreme commanders on both sides, I found superior judgment remained the most important factor. Supreme commanders make decisions, and decisions make history. Military supreme commanders act as decision funnels for their side, so ideas, options, courses of action kind of go in the top, and they get funneled through uh, a narrow neck, and only one strategic choice comes out the bottom. This is in line with what Sun Tzu described at the end of chapter six of The Art of War. Military command equal or akin to shaping and harnessing the power of water. So let's put a pin in that thought for right now, senior generals as decision funnels, and let's turn to development or building that funnel, which leads to the age old question, how do you educate a general? And based on my research, you can't, at least not entirely. They have to do it themselves. My finding was that informal self-study mattered a lot more than formal education. Think podcast listening, newspaper reading, and essay writing over degrees attained and diplomas achieved. I'm not suggesting we throw away military schools, but a successful supreme commander the War College cannot alone make. And to tackle the point Dr. Metz actually just raised, can the assistant manager of a CarMax make a great supreme commander? Uh, General Stan McChrystal's also made that case when he said, I've dealt with a lot of CEOs that could walk in and be general officers in the military tomorrow because they solve problems and they lead people. But that's wrong. Apologies to McChrystal and the leadership at the local CarMax on the Carlisle Pike. Uh, but generalship and supreme command are different. To sell a car, one doesn't have to spend human lives. To seal a deal, a business person doesn't have to kill anybody unless you're Russian. And, <laughs> Based on my research, successful supreme command and generalship includes both aptitude and acculturation. War is unique. Success demands familiarity, which means, sorry, car maxers and office warriors, no four star for you. So what does that mean for 2030? Uh, let's return to Michael Howard, who noted that when new generations have no personal memory of a previous war, it brings on all kinds of problems. So how will emerging generations impact generalship? In 2030, the greatest generation will be dead, and the baby boomers will be retired. Generation X will be the generals, of which I am proudly one of the youngest members. Millennials will be field grades, and Generation Z, my kids, uh, will be our cadets and company commanders. On the plus side, there's some real military talent in that youngest generation. My three-year-old Georgie will make you forget Patton. My six-year-old daughter Grace will make you beg for mercy. But there's a flashing red light there. Though Faulkner said the past is never really past, the Cold War and what came before will be dead to our entire senior military leadership. 
No experience with earthquakes of extreme violence or truly global great power wars, even the cold kind. If our professional sin of the past generation was forgetting counterinsurgency, then big war amnesia looms large in 2030. This matters because the future is not what it used to be, as Yogi Berra once said. A generation ago, we then saw better days ahead when the wall came down. A generation ahead, we now see scarier days when one of us can kill all of us, according to one widely read columnist. As with generational shifts, future leaders will be prisoners of the problems of their day, but also blind to some of the problems of the past. So I think the funnel metaphor will still apply in 2030. Senior generals and supreme commanders will still close with and destroy future enemies with superior decisions. But I think the funnel has and will continue to get wider at the top and wider at the bottom. There'll be more options and more choices. And the funnel will also look different, shaped by the times and painted by five different emerging colors. Strategic leaders of the future will be more global. All major American allies are in demographic decline. Um, if there's a Korean or a Japanese exchange officer in the audience, you need to have more children. This will force countries to share burden, burdens. It's, not, it's one thing not to want to spend blood and treasure. It's another thing entirely not to have enough young people and money to spend. This will mean more multinational operations, overseas assignments, and international engagement. Strategic leaders of the future will be more technical. A flip phone probably isn't going to cut it. There's no stars in my future. Narrative will matter more to future strategic leaders. Getting the other side to believe in your story matters more than it used to now that everybody has access to unlimited information. Harry Truman once said, leaders are readers, but I'd add successful leaders are writers and readers. Speed may kill, but storytellers win. Strategic leaders of the future will be more meritocratic. Public belief in the old experienced white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male at the head of an institution, I think has been shaken. The American people have grown more comfortable with young and different leaders in positions of power. We ought to at least consider speedier and other pathways to strategic leadership positions. Finally, strategic leaders of the future will be more female. Broadly speaking, Women are outperforming men in nearly every educational category. As I mentioned, I was just at West Point where I saw the Pershing Award handed out, which is recognition of the top senior or firsty essays on officership. Four of the six awardees were women. The first captain at West Point or the top ranked cadet is a woman. And that's out of a student body that's about 25% and rising fast now that the combat exclusion policy is out of the way. Second, the way women are perceived by society, our very strategic culture has changed from the movies to elite military schools to even combatant command. More women will run the show. The Mac of 2030 may sport sensible earrings instead of a corn cob pipe. The next Marshall may have sleeve tattoos. And the next Eisenhower may actually be a Chan or a Chavez. As a final deliberately provocative thought, while I think leadership matters, I do want to put a big stick of dynamite on the idea that leadership as a general concept wins wars. It's not leadership, it's superior judgment that matters most relative to our adversaries. Um, or as Field Manual 6-22 Army leadership might call it, intellect. This should be our highest professional standard in how we judge military leadership. So that, Dr. Sewell, that was my answer for your question. That's what Washington, Grant, and Eisenhower can teach us. War is as much a clash of judgments as it is a clash of wills. If war is a gamble, then it matters who's making the bets. And since I started with a bet, I'm finishing with a, I've started with a debt, I'm finishing with a bet, I choose casino terms advisedly to reinforce the thought that before we roll the iron dice, we really ought to think hard about who's calling the military shots, which is why I'm so thankful to be a part of this panel. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Major Cavanaugh made uh, a really important point about uh, uh, the need to harness technology as an aspect of leadership. I just wanted to kind of use this conference uh, as one example of the way technology can, 
can be harnessed for these sorts of things. Uh, there are five speakers uh, and panelists over the next couple of days who I literally met for the first time last night or today, but I've known and admired for a long time on Twitter. So I was actually using that as my method of network building and kind of talent scouting and finding the people that had interesting, important things to, to say. And, you know, and I brought that to bear on, uh, on what we're doing here today. So with that said, what I would like to do is to open the discussion by turning it over to you and allow you to push back, comment, questions, or whatever. So who would, who would like to uh, kick us off? Uh, Danny Barron, Cinema 11. Uh, you know, uh, it seems to me that uh, if our future leaders are robots, <laughs> uh, there is a missing element of courage. Uh, we just heard a, a great presentation about how yesterday um, the leadership within Ukraine left when uh, Russia came across the border. Uh, it was the resounding motivation of the people that rose up for the pride of Ukraine. Uh, Churchill motivated people to fight on the beaches, to, to, uh, to not give up until they were in the pool of blood to prevent that swastika from being raised. How do you make up the difference of motivation and courage in the option of artificial intelligence leaders. Great point. And if you'd like to take that on, the, the concept of courage, is that something that's going to change or is it going to be persistent? Are you good? But, uh, yeah, go I'll, ahead. I'll pit. Uh, it, courage, courage has changed. Um, it's, it's always evolving. You know, the, the farther we started with one ape slapping another ape, and we've, you know, we started flinging things at one another, and now we're flinging things at much, 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 much greater distance. So there's much less skin in the game. And that's, some argue that that's incredibly problematic. Others just say this is just a better way of, pro more efficient way of prosecuting combat. Um, I see that as, as sort of different from the political leadership you're, you're alluding to, Churchill and the political leadership of the Ukraine. So is there a particular, I'm, I, I wanna return the, fa return the question, are, are you interested in the military side and the, stand, the greater standoff distance of warfare or uh, societies that have or have not the willingness to stand and fight a, 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 a close, closely proximate threat. I guess I'm trying to say is that uh, if a robot is leading me and he's saying, go give your life, uh, a robot doesn't have a life to, to lay down. And so there's, there's a missing element of motivation for courage to, to sacrifice. Yeah, and, and let me uh, let me kind of jump in there myself. I mean, we all know that one of the evolutions in generalship over the past centuries has been that we got military strategic leaders away from the front, you know, back toward the rear. I mean, in the Civil War, those that put themselves at the front very often didn't li uh, live through the war. So one of the challenges for an Eisenhower or a, you know, a more contemporary general is how do you motivate people to go out and put themselves in harm's way when you aren't uh, directly. Uh, my guess would be that that trend is going to continue even <laughs> further because, I mean, we all know now that we've reached a point where, where people can be in combat in Afghanistan, you know, setting in a room somewhere in Nevada. So you have this kind of separation of physical risk and, uh, and, and uh, the military act that I think is gonna continue. But, but as I heard your question, I kind of saw a, a parallel idea there that I, I think when you're talking about courage, you're talking about not just the courage of soldier, sailors, airmen, marine who are in harm's way, but you're talking about kind of the, the uh, I, I think you're using courage uh, uh, as an aspect of the resilience of societies. 
And I mean, that is something that's still going to matter. You know, when you talk about Churchill and the British people in World War II, uh, it wasn't really the courage so much of the British people as the, uh, the, the, the willingness to be resilient when your nation is under attack and you're, you're, you're paying uh, a great price. At least my guess would be that for coming decades, even if we move to a point where the tip of the spear, the people fighting are actually automated, we're still going to have to have resilient societies. So I think that particular, you know, that Churchillian ability to explain to a nation why it's being attacked, why people are dying, why things are burning, and to be steadfast in the face of that is probably going to, I would think, is going to be part of more of the enduring character, I mean, the enduring nature rather than the changing character of, uh, of conflict. Uh, Sarah, Chuck, do either you want to weigh in on that? I might add the idea that, again, moral courage is something we see at the lower levels of organizations here again, where people are at the grassroots and the tactical level, they expose themselves to risk. I think the primary concern for strategic leaders is this idea of moral courage, the idea of making major decisions that's going to shape the, either the nature of the institution and might even put the nation at risk. So how do you provide candid, official, good advice to senior political leaders uh, that may be contrary to their desires because you want to make sure you protect the force but also protect the society? Uh, I'd like to add that I, I think one of the uh, as yet maybe underexplored areas of future conflict and one of the biggest problems that will be facing strategic leaders in the United States and in all democracies, not so much for those who are not democracies, is going to be the ability of essentially an automated threat system to divorce public will from national leadership and force capitulation. It's a variation on the theme of what Steve was just talking about, but you know, it has been a long time since the American people have been asked to sacrifice anything. And by that I don't mean the military community, I'm talking about the broader general population. We have been so insulated from the notion of sacrifice for the nation and for the survival of our way of life and our institutions. And so my biggest worry about strategic leadership and the way in which war is evolving is that either through strategic disinformation or through a takedown of the power grid, which we now know is all too possible, or through other means that are, again, short of war, that we might have, that the, that the real test of strategic leadership in the future will be to keep the courage of the American people alive so that we don't capitulate in any meaningful way short of war. And that can be a policy accommodation as much as it can be a generalized defeat. But I think this notion of what, what that split between our society and our, our sense of resolve and what our leaders are trying to get us to, to basically stick out, I think the ability to, for that to diverge in a democratic system is a, is a significant threat and vulnerability that our adversaries will exploit, and strategic leaders need to think in advance about how to prevent that split. Maybe the uh, in the future, the public, rather than being asked to grow victory gardens during a major conflict, will be asked to use their computers at home to create Bitcoin that can be used to fund the war. So maybe that's the sacrifice of the... Well, I'm thinking more about not doing their online banking and making do without electricity, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question from the virtual audience. Uh, this is from Brian Cook, and it says, for Matt Kavanaugh, what do you consider as the currency of future strategic leaders? Are they different from today? So I, I still think that superior judgment will be an enduring characteristic of future strategic leaders of successful future strategic leaders. One thing I didn't get a chance to talk about because there just wasn't time was that there's, there's sort of two components to that. There's the sense to get something more right or better than your opponent, but then there's the sensibility that, it, that accompanies that. And, and I, the, the, two, the two characteristics that I think that you can identify through those memorandums, dispatches, and decisions are a distinct sense of empathy and a sense of what we might call grit, which is like a directed determination. Not just the ability to sort of break big rocks and make them small, but to actually harness yourself to, a, or commit yourself to a particular 
um, direction. One thing that I found during those campaigns that I was, that I was talking about actually was that all three of uh, these successful Supreme Commanders shed actual tears that you can point to in the historical record during those campaigns. And I don't say that as sort of a, a dig or anything. I actually see that as an indicator of emp a sense that, um, that a, a true feeling for other human beings that, that you're sending to die. And I, I would connect that to the ability to better understand uh, other human beings' goals and objectives, which, which might also be, uh, you, you could consider it your, your commander in chief or a political leader, that sort of thing. Um, so I see the same process going forward into the future, but that conversion um, will use slightly different methods and tools. So that superior judgment will look a little different. The funnel will look a little different. So General Washington used the Council of War system. Um, he had about 50 of them that you can point to in the record that's, that exists in the archive. General Grant wrote a lot of dispatches to trusted advisors like Sherman and Halleck. Eisenhower had a full military staff that, that you, would, you would probably see or know of. It, it looks similar to what we have today. Um, in the future, one tool that I see that might be of great use to future Supreme Commanders would be big data, but then not just the inhuman or AI aspects of big data, but how we can use big data to improve our own judgment. So some of you might be familiar with uh, Philip Tetlock's Good Judgment Project through the uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency at the University of Pennsylvania. So they, it's, a, it's a judgment tournament where you're forecasting geopolitical potentials or possibilities. So you're saying, I think X will happen with some percent of, of confidence. Um, that process has been proven to both improve judgment, because you know, by, by practicing it, you get better at it, but then also you can see who's, who, are, who is naturally better at it. And that's something that I think that we ought to consider for our senior leaders. There's no reason why, as someone pins on their first star, they could not start some process of improving their own uh, geopolitical judgment skills. So that's a good the, question. I think the ultimate currency has to be trust. This idea that a senior leader has developed trust among their, uh, their peers, trust within the organization, and then trust with their stakeholders or people outside the organization. The trust is based upon one, confidence in their confidence in their ability, the trust in their uh, integrity, what they say they will do, that they will do, and then also this reliability and, and understand the motives are benevolent, service above self. Without that trust, it's hard to lead organizations, but it's also hard to engender a partnership with political and civilian masters in the process. Uh, Colonel Dowell Rupp, uh, Seminar 17. Dr. Metz, this question is for you. One of the things you mentioned was the idea that in the future, in the context of enhanced human performance or AI, we might have to make an ethical decision about uh, to meet an adversary who has acted in, in an unethical way, uh, whether to meet them down in the gutter. Um, our adversaries have in the past always acted in, in, in an unethical way, and we have yet to do so. Our adversaries now act in an unethical way, and we don't join them in the gutter. So what makes you think that we would change the answer to that question in the future when that asymmetry has already, has always existed? Yeah, I, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to explore that even more during the, the, you know, kind of ethics and ethos panel tomorrow. But let me, let me take a quick stab at it. I mean, I guess what I would say is, is, you know, I wouldn't say that we haven't joined them in the gutter, but we have often made compromises along the way, necessary compromises. I mean, the fact that we did, you know, strategic bombing of civilian areas in World War II, uh, the fact that we have done certain things in counterinsurgency that we otherwise would have, would have preferred to do. So I, I agree with you completely that we have resisted kind of meeting an enemy at their own ethical level as much as possible, although we have made compromises uh, as well. What I was thinking of when I made that point, though, was, was this. 
And that, that, that is that when you're overwhelmingly preponderant, that makes it a lot easier for you to take the ethical high road. So if you buy the notion that America's military, economic, political preponderance is comparatively declining, I don't know if you'd say if we're in outright decline, but kind of the rise of all the West, if you buy the notion that we will face adversaries in the future that for a variety of reasons we're less preponderant over, what I was getting at is that kind of narrows the decision window for us somewhat. In other words, we might face a decision in the future of do we sink to their ethical level or do we lose? You know, we, 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 we luckily haven't been faced with that dilemma many times in our past, but, I, but what I was getting at is that that may be part of the future. But, but hopefully we'll, we'll get deeper into the ethics of it during the, the panel tomorrow. Let me turn to another question with the virtual audience. This is from JD. Uh, have we reached equilibrium, interesting word, among race, gender, et cetera? If so, and all folks have an equal shot at reaching top strategic position, is it time to end quotas, affirmative action, and awareness events? Panel? Looking out at this audience, I would say no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, guy. Brother, right. I'll piggyback no. Um, no equilibrium, we haven't reached that. To some, you know, um, on, the, on the issue of whether all folks have an equal shot at senior strategic leadership, no, they don't. But part of that is obviously attributed to experience. So we, we privilege combat experience, and until the recent combat exclusion policy, that just meant more men, you know, infantry officers, combat arms officers, that sort of thing. I think that we're likely to see that shift and change. There will be, now that we've uh, taken that out of the equation, we will match, it, there'll be a natural rise. But as to whether we should abolish quotas, it, so I, I, I'm a functional area 59, an army strategist, a, a staff, I'm a professional staff officer. Mm -hmm. And the, the one thing that you figure out pretty quick when you read the literature on, on how, on group performances, particularly staff performances, is that diversity is a strength. So that if, if, you, if you line up a bunch of people with the same experiences and same backgrounds, you do not get as good a product as if, as if you bring in a much more diverse group of people. It depends on the problem, but that's a general truth, I think, that you would find in, in any business uh, or strategic literature. And so I, e pluribus unum. I mean, out of many, one, we, I think that diversity is a characteristic we ought to shoot for. Whether we apply a quota or not, I, that's so, different. So I have to qualify this idea of diversity. Diversity gives you better performance in innovative and stressful climates. And so diversity is functional diversity and psychological diversity. So I have a colleague here at Philip Burry in the War College. If you go over our careers for the past 35 years, we have a lot of the same assignments. I was hired as a professor here at the War College, so if you compare our view of the world, we're probably pretty similar. If you look at Ed, Philiberti, and me, you know that we're not the same. So I think what we're trying to find here again is that there's a dynamic equilibrium in existing societies that you're gonna adjust to based upon the needs of the environment and the alignment of the, of the institution. And what we might find here again is that we don't know what the right number is gonna be. What we do want is the best prepared, want the greatest experience, and also the greatest talents to kind of emerge in a process. Uh, sometimes if you don't have those affirmative action goals, you restrict the intake to the system. So you may preclude the best from even having a chance to compete. So I think at the opening part of the funnel, we need to make sure we have the widest possible uh, opportunity for folks to join and then allow them to develop perform and be evaluated so that they can succeed in the long term. Structurally, here again, for our strategic leaders, they're gonna be from combat arms, they're gonna be from operational assignments, and they're gonna to have to go through the wicket designed by folks like that, which becomes very restrictive from the top end. And let me make a comment on that myself. I'm somebody that in life has always looked at learning, development, uh, you know, whether ethical or otherwise, as not something one does, 
but as a never-ending process. Uh, I'm a fanatic motorcyclist. Somebody once said, well, when did you learn to ride a motorcycle? And I kind of got a perplexed look and said, well, I began the learning process uh, 10 years ago, but hopefully the learning process will continue until whenever my last ride is. And so I kind of look at uh, building the Army, the Joint Force, to uh, reflect the nation as something that we've begun. And it may, in fact, be time to end quotas and stuff like that, but becoming better at that, like be by learning anything at ethical development, you know, I look at it as a never-ending process. So I think it's going to be something that we continue to do forever, and we never quite get there because we can always get, ju you know, just a, a, a little better at it. Uh, way in the back. You know, Lieutenant Colonel Lang, Seminar 11, what's the problem statement? So you, you started this with, with questions. We've heard what the panel has to say. I'm not, I didn't take it as an indictment that those with extensive operational experience, you know, may not be the right make model series for the future leader. But what's the problem? Okay, was we understand, visualize, and describe the trends of the future operating environment in automation and technology. The character is changing, but the nature is not. And I think we're using strategic leadership in a generic term. Right? The functional roles and responsibilities of strategic leaders, those with operational I don't see a general officer yet, and I'm sure many panels, but so we're talking about the evaluation of what makes a good general officer. And it goes back from their judgment, which ties from their experience, decades of dedication and experience of failures and combat and challenges. So I asked the panel, maybe you need to break it down for me because I'm a Marine. What's the problem statement? Thank you. Anyone? So I, I would say, how, how is it that we identify and develop strategic leaders prepared to succeed in 2030? That, that's, how I, that's how I looked at the panel. And when, when, I, when I did my own dissertation research, um, I was looking at the characteristics that differentiated success from, from unsuccessful. And one thing that I you'll excuse me on a, to address a pet peeve. So I hate the term good strategist, bad strategist, or good general, bad general, good supreme commander, bad supreme commander. There is no good or bad. There is only better than the opponent that you're given, or better than, than the opponent or the environment that you're given. It's superior. That's what we're looking for. Because the, the standard against which we should all be prepared to be judged is the enemy and the environment. So, um, sorry, I, that's a pet peeve, but th those are a couple thoughts I have on your... Just to respond back to that, does the system and the methods that we have now, because you're talking talent management and development, do we have it wrong now? Is that, is that the, the, the narrative that I'm picking up from this panel this morning? That so, it's wrong the way we're going forward now? So, not wrong, but could be better. I mean, certainly, I think it certainly could be better. But. Well, I think not... not it depends what you mean. It depends. Yeah. I mean, strategic leadership is a vague term, which is where I started out my comments, right? So, you know, strategic leader for what? Strategic leader against what problem? In what context, right? So it's vague. You're right. The problem statement's not particularly clear. If you narrow it down to say, are, is there anything wrong with our process now? Wrong's a big word, right? So again, break that down better. So, and that says be superior. But I think, I think the reason why Steve wanted to have this conference is to suggest that we may be unprepared for the ways in which strategic leadership needs to morph and adapt. So for example, if, a, if someone coming up early on is not thinking about how automation, AI, China are going to affect the kinds of decisions that they're going to need to make, if they're not thinking about how civil-military relations in our old in our old construct, which was, you know, the civilian says go and the military does their thing, doesn't work in the likely future scenarios, they're not thinking about those things, then they're not being prepared. So, so there's both, we can always improve, and there's second, this is a really rapidly changing environment with some key variables that really challenge some of the tenets on which we've based our preparation and our training. And if you're looking back, sure, there may be some enduring things, but you cannot tell me that the 2050 yeah. war fighting scenario looks a heck of a lot like the historic circumstances that were offered up by everybody who's spoken to you. So I think that's really the problem set. 
Another statement here, too, is that we've been focused on general officers in charge of combatant commands or war fighting organizations. There's also a need for talent, experience, and expertise to manage the enterprise. And again, we found consistently that there's been challenges here again in how we do that. And we've questioned the judgment of, the, of past senior leaders, not only in combat, but also in the enterprise. The question comes up, if you have to nominate a senior Army military officer for a position in combatant command, where is the trust and confidence of that process with our civilian masters? In the past decade or so, it has been lacking in some cases. Our dean has talked a few times about uh, the results of the U.S. Army and our military in the past decade of war in the global war of terrorism. If we don't win the war to achieve political objectives, who has the responsibility for that? The military has to bear some of that along with our political masters. So that's a question of judgment along with intellect and trust in the process. Yeah, and let me, let me just add one more point to that. In the old era where we had long conventional wars, we could, in effect, use trial by combat uh, as a method of identifying talent. I mean, we all know that in you know, 1861, 1862, the Civil War, there were a lot of really, really crappy uh, commanders you know, in World War II, Kasserine Pass and stuff like that. What happens was that after a year or two and lots and lots of deaths, we found out who was really good and who wasn't. If you buy the notion that trends in the strategic environment are changing to the extent that we won't have kind of two to four years to kind of figure out in, in the future, you know, who really will be effective and who won't, that we need to find some way of knowing, knowing know, to know that going in, then that would suggest that what we need to do is to find better ways up front rather than hoping that combat will work it out. And, and also, uh, Chuck, something you made me think of there is, um, is we're also, you know, as, as Sarah indicated, that strategic leadership in the future will be more interagency, might be even public-private in the security environment of, of the future. Mm -hmm. So there you have a different skill set than someone who's come up through, you know, the military command and, and, and PME type uh, type system. So I mean, I, you know, I, I think Sarah articulated it beautifully that what we're talking about is we're not saying everything we're doing is wrong, but I, you know, I do believe that what we're saying is that we can be even better, particularly as new challenges uh, emerge. Yep. Lieutenant Colonel Rich Pfeiffer, uh, Army Officer Seminar 13. Uh, we're talking a lot about uh, being able to identify what makes them. How do, we, how do we recognize and measure the, you know, the grit, the empathy, the judgment, the trust? What are some suggestions on how to identify those early? Because we're talking about what we need, but how do we Identify it. I can stab at that. Oh. Well, it, I I think that it's it's really hard. You know, th there's an old I don't remember who said it, but uh, I think it was a former Secretary of State was asked, you know, how did you succeed? And his answer was good judgment. And then someone asked him, how did you develop that good judgment? And his response was bad judgment. You know, just through mistakes. <laughs> and. Um, the, the issue is that you, you don't want to make those mistakes when the, when the consequences are incredibly severe. Um, scenarios, tabletop exercises, war games, and judgment tournaments like I, like I just mentioned, those are some of the examples, I think, um, that, that can be helpful in a, a basic awareness of history, of understanding um, what has come before and, and what, what the consequences what might be for mistake. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always help us in future environments where the consequences are potentially radically different. So North Korea right now potentially poses some very different challenges to what we've seen in the past. But, but anything that, that exercises the judgment muscle and hopefully without terrifying consequences. So I'll go back to Army doctrine. FM 6-22 Army leadership says that there's three primary attributes for a, a leader. The first one being intellect. You want to have smart people. We can measure that. Second one being about character. Uh, uh, having a system of ethics and morality and, and, and employing your values. The third one is about presence. 
Are you able to be around people, be empathetic, and lead them, and they trust you in the process? We can assess most of those things in some context, whether it's by an instrument or by observing them as they interact with other entities. I think as you look at scholarship students for either West Point or ROTC, for some reason we go back and look at what they do in high school, if in groups and teams. Are they involved with leadership? Are they working civic responsibility projects? Are they engaging with other people? And are they respected and trusted by their community? They'll take their SAT or ACT, they'll take a GRE. We know how smart they can be, but do they have any other issues that are in their background that would preclude them from being successful? So the key is to bring in and open the door for talented people and allow them to develop, and then you assess them based upon the requirements of the institution and either promote them or window them out in the process. I think one of the challenges we have here again with our top uh, system that we bring in from the bottom is how do you bring in folks who are also talented from the lateral entry for things that we need, maybe for the enterprise or special functions that we don't grow within ourselves. And, and, and let me just kind of toss out uh, a, 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 a thought there. I mean, what the military kind of has now is that the judgment bar is pretty low. I mean, if you, you know, have egregiously bad judgment and you, you, know, you, you demonstrate that during a command or whatever, then that might end your military career. But, but, but as long as you kind of meet the standard, you're okay. If we buy the notion that judgment is a really crucial, essential part of strategic leadership, might we somehow integrate it into staff and war colleges where we not only test that, but when you finish the year, only a small percentage of people have gotten a high enough J grade that they're truly promotable to a flag rank. I mean, everyone else, it's like, you know, you did okay, you met the standard, you can kind of be, you know, an 05 or 06, but that's kind of the, the top end because you, you didn't have, you didn't demonstrate extraordinary judgment. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's something that's really, really radical and would, you know, and, and have a lot of downsides as well, but that is an idea for, a method that if you buy this notion that judgment is extraordinarily important, we could in fact test for it some way and we could in fact make that test really, really oh, matter. Right. Sorry. Yep. Sir, right. Yeah, uh, Dexter Nunley. So my, I've got a two part question for the entire panel. So the first part is um, are we looking at what makes a strategic leader um, incorrectly? So I've heard everybody talk about strategic leaders and all of them have been defined um, based on some trial by fire, Churchill, World War II. Um, but you mentioned earlier, prior to World War II, Churchill was about to get fired, um, especially coming out of World War I. Um, think about somebody like Mayor Rudolph, Rudy Giuliani, who prior to 2001 and 911 was really not considered a, a, a great mayor by many in that city, yet 2001 hits, um, and all of a sudden he's a, he's a strategic leader, he's great. So my question is, are we looking at what makes a strategic leader incorrectly instead of looking at the body of work to identify whether or not they have the ability to understand what's needed based on what's going on at the time, whether or not it's a trial by fire or nothing's going on, and can provide the type of leadership and make the judgment decisions that are needed for that time. The second question, part to this question, is based on your uh, assessment that um, goals are not value neutral, I think is what you said. Um, who gets to make the decision on whether or not the values are right? Um, and then the other part of that is I'd look at Lincoln and say that a strategic leader has the ability to look at the values that are current and determine whether or not that's the value we need to continue with going forward. Um, I think Harry Truman did the same thing when he realized, hey, we need to integrate the armed forces. So those two questions um, anybody can answer. Thank you. Well, I can start. I mean, I think those are really incisive questions. And I, I do think that in terms of the latter piece, you know, we've got, we've got a couple layers to think about the values element of leadership. So um, the hardest kind of strategic leadership is when you're bucking the dominant thinking of the time. And that's why I mentioned that, you know, people like King and Gandhi who led social movements that, that started without the, the formal attributes of power and yet managed to make change happen in the face of massive obstacles that were cognitive and emotional, not just material. Um, that's, that's the, to me, the most impressive kind of leadership. But 
But the, even, even to, to further disaggregate, the building leadership is different from the, the defending leadership is different from the destroying leadership, right? So I think we've got two layers of this, this challenge when we think about the United States because we have a democracy and so we have civil military relations and we have, we have, we have institutions through which the values are defined. There are moments when strategic leaders need to depart from those. I remember, um, yeah, so, so and that, th that, those, are the truest, those are the truest tests, but they may be less common in a military context than in a broader strategic leader context. So for, to, to my mind, within the military sphere, since A, the theory is that you're getting the guidance on the values and you're implementing the issue is, is more about how, you, how, how true you stay to that guidance, which, which actually brings me back to an earlier question about, you know, we're always the good guys, and when are we, what are the risks that we have that we're going to abandon our values as we seek to defend our nation and our way of life? And the reality is that we will abandon those values when we think they are in the way of preserving our way of life. This is Ma Wal Michael Walser, this is Just War Theory, this is Supreme Emergency, like that's what we will do. So that seems to me the area in which, in which, in the construct that most of this conversation is happening about a war fighter being a strategic leader for military institutions in a time of crisis, that strikes me as the most sort of common um, Piece. When are you going to be making the recommendation to the civilian leadership that we got to we got to try something different, even if we're not comfortable with it? And just something that I didn't get a chance to offer before. One of the interesting things about this future operating environment and technology is, if you look at big tech and you look particularly at Google and you look at some of its acquisitions or you look at some of its workforce statements, they're all saying they don't want to get engaged in warfare. They don't want to get their hands dirty. And yet, you've got China saying, we're going big on AI. We're not having any concerns about privacy. We're not having any concerns about public-private. We're just all going in. We're going to funnel stuff. We're going to make sure that what's created actually serves our national objectives, and they're going to be security objectives. You've got some interesting disconnects that are broader and societal that actually affect our industrial base in ways we haven't even started talking about it now. And they're going to strain, again, the categories that we thought, we've thought of in terms of defining our nation and our institutions. So it's a bit of a, of a detour. Now I've forgotten your first part of your question. I'm sorry. So I think the issue here is that we try to <laughs> conflate this idea of strategic leaders and leadership. The leaders are individuals that are in position of responsibilities by some organizational chart and diagram. For the U.S. military, three and four-star commanders, combatant commanders, and maybe enterprise-level uh, function functionaries. Uh, we define leadership here again as a process. Who is it that assumes responsibilities for achieving the organizational purpose, for crafting out a vision, and the alignment, alignment of that? That's kind of the key thing. So we might find here again, you have a person of responsibility that's in a position that does not perform well as a strategic leader. And the institution or the environment will pick someone else when they're not successful. So the question comes up in the development process, do you have the best team available to meet the requirements of the environments when it emerges? If the process is not in place for that, then you're going to have to relook that and maybe do something differently. It, yeah, there's, it, it, so I, a little uh, background, Colonel Nunley uh, was the G6 in the division I served in in 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. So somewhere the network is down, I'm sure. But uh, so uh, there, there is certainly a Darwinian evolution to command. Um, the, the commanders, the cases that I looked at, they were not entirely successful. Uh, they had mixed results in some cases earlier in their careers. And there's, a, there's an old World War I saying that it takes 15,000 casualties, I think, to train a division commander. Yeah. Um, but, and, and to some extent, this is Tom Ricks' argument in his book, The Generals, which you should all go home if you have it, take it off the shelf and put it in the fire. Um, because, <laughs> because his argument in that, in, that, in that book is essentially that we should look to outcome entirely that we won World War II because we were willing to fire general officers, and that's certainly not the case. It's important for us to look at results and outcome, but if we just look at results and outcome, we're, we're not gonna succeed, because if you went by that, we, we would not have won uh, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, or the Second World War. 
Um, you have to look at the process. You have to look at what, what goes into the decisions that are made that lead to those outcomes. And again, it, it, some of you will remember uh, Paul Yingling's argument from 2007 entitled, uh, it's an essay entitled A Failure in Generalship. And one of his points is that one of the inputs that we were lacking was that we did not have enough humanities degrees amongst the general, that generals didn't have enough uh, higher education. So the input wasn't enough. But we can't just look at the process alone either. We have to look at uh, the context and the opponent. So the enemy and the environment. Those, those four things, I think, are really how we evaluate success and failure. So outcome, process, and then the context, enemy and environment. So We have time for one more. Yep. Morning. I'm Colonel Ferrali. So, uh, you know, we're having a great conversation here on identifying what it is that those uh, those attributes that we kind of want to look at as we as we identify and you know select, identify uh, and and develop those strategic leaders. So my question is is a little bit more practical in nature. So if we speculate that today and tomorrow we determine all of those best attributes that we really want in those strategic leaders. What are the forcing mechanisms that will drive and reinforce and preserve those changes in the Army selection and promotion process? Maybe I'm getting too deep here, and maybe that's not what we're here for, but you know, I've been hearing about you know, broadening assignments for 20 plus years and how great a broadening assignment is and, and that our leaders, we need, to, we need to have more broadly educated leaders. But the reality of it is most of the people in this room that are going on to brigade command probably were platoon leaders, assistant S3, company commander, an OC at NTC, S3, XO, so forth, so on. Uh, probably nearly everyone in here is going on to a brigade command position. You will not find a whole lot of broadening assignments, or even if you do, that broadening assignment was probably not the decision maker that got them selected for brigade command. So how are we as an institution going to change to recognize those leaders that are different? And, and the last part of this is, and, and I think Chuck hit on it, just because we bring females and minorities in, if they look different but don't think differently, we haven't changed anything. So if they're still not going through broadening assignments, it's a female that's been a platoon leader and a company commander and so forth and so on, we haven't really changed the institution. Chuck, you want to jump on that? So the meat of the question is... The meat of the question is... So I think what we have here is an example of the institution being misaligned what we're trying to accomplish. If the promotion timeline, career timeline doesn't support, again, development and selection of talented people for what we need, then we have to change the processes and look, we look at that. I think we're doing some things here with the Future of the Army initiatives to try to provide uh, either breaks in service uh, to make sure we expand the, the reach of how we go in and find talented people across the society. But a part of the process is going back and looking at culture. That's kind of the War College hand wave. Always look at the culture. It's really about those things that we can identify that provide for successful contribution of organizational members to the, the overall mission. And it may require us, to, again, to change some of our paradigms, our models, and to try some things. Again, uh, we keep hearing innovative societies and cultures innovate by trying a lot of different things and proving the principle that some things might work. So changing our own mindset about what makes a successful leader. I think we had a review of education and training of Army leaders, a retail study done a few years ago that looked at brigade commanders over maybe 30 brigade commanders over 20 some years of service. If you color coded their years of assignments with Army for green or purple for joint, what we found is that the majority of them never had anything not an Army ass assignment. Uh, General Dave Barnell wrote a study a couple of years ago on building better generals. And what he found here consistently is that as we promote people based upon their last performance and their last tactical assignments to the next assignment, uh, we'll get to a grade of one star. And he said the problem is, is that we'll promote one stars that can't be effective three-star officers. That's a case of misalignment. 
was to go back and reevaluate that and figure out how we want to change it. And that's beyond my expertise at this point. So, Steve, anything else to Matt? Comment? So, the broadening assignment thing, I really take seriously. I mean, it, I, sitting next to Dr. Sewell is like a broadening assignment. You know, it, we, it's like we list everything. But um, to some extent, nothing in my ORB, my officer record brief, tells anyone anything about my actual judgment ability. It's a list of experiences which may indirectly be an indicator of, of some ability based on what I've done before, but I don't think that it actually is a, a real measure of the characteristics or of my aptitude for strategic leadership or much, I mean, much else other than what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that when we start to change that, then we'll start to see some change. Uh, much left to discuss, but unfortunately, we're at the end of this panel. Uh, we're going to go into uh, break now. If you'll be back in your seats at 1030 for the second panel, please join me in thanking uh, this morning's panel.